And in those mosques, unfortunately, um, people are very religious there. And when they saw the tsunami coming, instead of running away, a lot of them ran to the mosque, thinking God is going to like really protect me. Well, God didn't do much against it. And what's funny on all of it is like everything, and it's not funny, sorry, <laughs> it's not the right word, but what's interesting is like everything has been flattened down, except the mosque, which was not finished, so that there were no interior walls, no resistance to the water, only the pillars, so the water went through. And this is the last building in South Bandache, which is still standing. And people were singing, thinking that this is a sign of God. The only building which is still standing is the mosque. And you have like a religious fever that started from this part, which is like this time, which is very important there. And this fueled the return to the Sharia law. You know what's Sharia law? The Islamic Sharia law? Go and take a dictionary. And uh, in the region. It's a very strict Islam law saying that they are overruling the civic, the civil law. You maybe have heard of it if you go to Afghanistan or this country. All right, then 35 meter over there. And it was not channeled or anything. There is no topographical effect over there. It was really the wave was 35 meter there. So that's more destruction. To tell you that we have been using also those buildings and try to get information out of it, measuring like the different height of the water. Yes? Is there anything else you can use other than tide marks on buildings? Um, when there is nothing left, left is difficult. The next part is about using like modeling. But to do modeling, you need like good data on the ground to like uh, calibrate your models. And models have been like proved like very inefficient up to present to this kind, this kind of modeling. They are good at sea, but when it comes to go to the uh, going to the ground, like uh, they are pretty useless actually, at least uh, at the fine scale. Here is different, something different. I was talking about wave height. Now is the run up. Does anyone know what's the run-up and what's the difference with, between wave height and run-up? Yeah, if something is the wave comes in, and it's saying like it whacks into the water, it carries on going up. There's evidence of it at Goosebeck, we call it, like it carried on going up about 20 meters. Yeah. So like the tsunami wave might only be like, all right, so it's 30 meters, but the run-up keeps going up. Yeah. It yeah, it's, it's, it's something like that. The run-up can be calculated from the ground when it's hit and obstacles it's going to carry on and going up. So that the water can be about this thick and you can have like 20 centimeters of water and the water can rise, rise like quite high on the topography. And to measure the run up, we are not going to measure the wave height this 20 centimeter, but the maximum level reached by the water compared to the, the average level of seawater, the zero, altitude zero level, okay? So that when you measure the wave height, it's from ground to top of the water, vertically, and when you measure the run-up, it's the uh, maximum altitude reached by the wave minus the zero altitude of average sea level. Does it make sense? Um. Oh yeah, you can use that. Imagine you have something like this. This is your mountain. The sea is here, sea level. Here is level zero. And you have a tsunami coming in. This guy comes in, and you have your wave, which is doing this. If you measure it here, wave height will be, let's say, 10 meter. This is the wave height. And if you want to measure the run-up, it's going to be between sea level and not the ground here. This is, the, this is going to be the measure of the, of the run-up. So that you are measuring two different things. I know my drawing is very ugly. Imagine this is water here. You, have to, you need a good imagination, I guess. And if your tsunami goes up, 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 up here, that's what I was saying, 
your wave height here can be 10 centimeter, but the run-up can be up to I don't know, 50 meter. And along the coast of Sumatra, you have some funnel shape bay, and we have measured the run up of being up to 52 meter as a maximum. It's, it's on the other side actually of this. The run up was 52 meter. And what's interesting is actually like. The water came from both sides, from both two different bays, and it was coming from the other side of this, and it was coming from this side as well, going up. So the water really met, met at the top. So those are the maximums. The maximum height was 35 meter, maximum run up was 52 meter. Any questions so far? These are the measurements we have done on the coast. Uh, at some places you can see 18 meta up to 31 meta extra extra. How can you explain such differences in the measurements in the field? Is it possible that right here it, the, the wave is 18 meta and like three meters away it's, going, it's like 31 or 35 meter high? Is there anything wrong? Didn't get anything that was high enough to measure. Yeah, exactly. Like measurement problems. And that's the second thing when you're going to do your 400 level, if some of you do, be careful of your measurements. Try to multiply them. And try to think about how you're taking them. And this is one of the big flow I see in physical geography right now is there is no <coughs> protocol when we take the data. And this is maybe something you want to change yourself. When you are doing sampling, write a protocol, how you are sampling, and how, like which uh, tools you are using, so that people can compare your results with their own. If I take samples in one way, and you take sample in another way, like the results may like look at the same data, but show very like uh, so some differences. And this seems something which is like not quite working well in physical geography yet. And that needs to be improved. Meaning that you guys have to improve it. The next generation. So again, some measurements. And these are the flows I was talking about. Even when we have like this 18 meter, it doesn't mean that the water didn't come on top of it. All right, velocity on land. <coughs> well, basically, we have no idea. And I'm writing a paper right now with a colleague of mine from France, and the assumption we had is like when the wave broke, the velocity of the wave increased. But looking at what's happening, at what happened in Japan, it's maybe the opposite, actually. When the wave broke, the velocity may have decreased. So we have not sorted it, this problem quite yet. Things like data are very difficult to collect. When you're there, what can you measure, which is going to give you some idea of the velocity? What can you look at? Things floating in the water. Yeah, but once it's finished, <coughs> once the water has receded, when you go on the field. What about stuff it's carried, i.e. a building or a car, obviously it's got to be stronger than like Yeah, exactly. Exactly, but um, <coughs> what's happening is like the, the basic idea is to look at, well, what the tsunami has been carrying and looking at the force it needs to carry this object, we can have an idea of the speed, extra, extra. Again, um, when you have like those poles here, that has been tilted by the tsunami, what is the necessary force to destroy this, to tilt those poles? In theory, excellent. The only problem is like, this is based on the fact that we assume that the, water, the tsunami is water, which is not. 
there are a lot of debris inside. And you can have like brought by the water other debris that come and collide with what's on the ground and will give you actually like um, measurements that are just like or calculations that are just wrong. And that's the same main problem with uh, modeling I was mentioning before. This change of Newtonian flow from, you know what is Newtonian flow? Dictionary again. Um, from the beach, I mean from the coast, sorry, coastline, incorporating slowly material, changing to a Bingham flow, B-I-N-G-H-A-M type of flow, again dictionary, that has a very different type of rheology. It's very difficult to model, like almost impossible right now. And that's one of the problems. <coughs> what is the rate of incorporation of material? How do, like, does the rheology change over time and inland? So that we tried, but um, the results are actually not really um, satisfying. And again, to do modeling, we need precise DEM, problem with rigorousity, boundary conditions. It's just what I just said. In terms of distances, well, the flow at its maximum reached about five kilometer, reaching the center of the main city, Bandache. And one of the indications we have that the water height was way larger than what happened in Japan is the fact that those large boats actually entered far into the city. When in Japan, large elements actually were left quite close to the coast. Like if you look at this image here, look at this place here. This is before the tsunami and this is after. Before, after. And you can see that something different on top of this destruction appeared in the landscape. Do you have any idea of what it can be? Very difficult to tell. Well, it's a huge power plant that was floating in the harbor of Bandache and went through the city. And when you look at the size, compared to the size of the houses, <coughs> actually on, the, on its way, it just destroyed all the houses, crushing every single thing. And we can follow its path all the way back to the sea. So that, again, those kind of elements bring more difficulties when it comes to measure the velocity of the waves inland as well. What do we measure? What was the energy and the force there? And quickly, within, within one minute, the direction of the waves so that what we used is the, the orientation again, again of tilted trunks. Oh, one thing I didn't say. We didn't use those palm trees to measure the wave height. Do you have any idea why? Palm trees, that leaves all top and right? Yeah. You see where they were scoured out? No, that's not the reason. They don't grow straight? No, that's not the reason. Okay, <laughs> I'm out yeah, yeah, yeah. Flexible. yeah, they're flexible. So that when the wave arrives, they just like bend and you can have like debris up to the top and they come back and you have the debris on top and you say, well, <laughs> cool, I have some good indication. After you actually, you have nothing. Again, tilted trunks. And the difficulty there is the fact that it's like, again, like in Japan, you don't have like one wave coming in in one direction. You have like different elements that forms the wave going in, two di in many different directions. And I think I have the groove now. Yeah, those grooves here, they are not perpendicular to the coast. They are parallel to the coast. And what happened is like the wave came in, went against all the cliff and took a right in uh, close to Bandache. And this wave actually was just going, flowing parallel to the seafront. And this is one of the main difficulty. And on top of that, once the water comes, 
what does go back, goes back, and it's going to like change again all those markers. 